Hello and welcome to Lessons in Humanities. Today's topic is the early republic, uh, Jeffersonian republicanism. This is the early part of the 1800s. So some of the topics or content that I will cover today includes a little bit about slavery and the Haitian uh, Revolution and how that changed the West, uh, a lot about Jefferson and what it was like underneath uh, Jefferson's presidency with the Louisiana Purchase, plus the Embargo Act, and uh, just really the early the early days of the Republic. This is uh, after George Washington and John Adams with a new president, the Democratic Republican president, or Jeffersonian Republic, uh, Republican president, Thomas Jefferson. So in 1800, the United States was still a new country. It was uncertain if the United States was going to survive. It only been about 10 or a little bit over 10 years since the new constitution was put into effect. And though uh, there were some tumultuous years in the 1790s under Washington and John Adams, it was doing okay. But the real worry was the election of 1800 because that was the year they were moving from a Federalist president to a Democratic Republican president, also known as a Jeffersonian Republican president. And it was unproven whether there would be violence and rioting and looting or some sort of uh, civil unrest when one party was changed to another party. Historically, usually it was violence that would um, have to take place for power to exchange. But the election of 1800, also known as the Revolution of 1800, was peaceful. And the new country, the United States, had a new president, and that was Thomas Jefferson. So, as I do with all my election videos, uh, I start with a, a timeline. So, this is a new timeline. This goes from 1800 to 1848. And it's easier to put history into chunks. It's easier to remember history that way versus remembering all the tiny little dates that can become very difficult and impossible sometimes. But the beginning of this time period is the 1800, is 1800, and that's, that's when we went from a Federalist president to a Democratic Republican president. And it's going to end in 1848, which is the Mexican-American War, which is going to give the United States a lot more territory, and it's also going to lead to the American Civil War. So in between, it's mostly about Western expansion, uh, starting with the Louisiana Purchase underneath uh, Thomas Jefferson. Now, last class was uh, Washington and Adams uh, in the lecture. This class is only going to be one president, and that's going to be Thomas Jefferson. He was very transformative. Uh, so I'm sure you've all he heard of Thomas Jefferson. He's the one who wrote the Declaration of Independence. Uh, he's also the third president in the United States. Okay, he's also known for things like <clears throat> creating the University of Virginia. And also, he, he really pushed the separation of church and state. Um, and he was an architect. Uh, he had many talents. He speak uh, numerous languages. So a very, very intelligent man. But you have to ask yourself a couple questions. He was a Democratic Republican, and he didn't really want a strong federal government, which was a little bit different from the Federalists. He believed that the states should have the rights. He wanted to also protect individual rights. So he didn't want this strong British-like king or executive branch that would rule over the people. So he was kind of what people might call a small government president. But when he was president, things will change, right? Realities will change and he will, uh, he, he, might, he might rule a little bit different than expected. Uh, but first, I want to talk a little bit about, about slavery uh, in the early 1800s. You know, in, in 1776, slavery was legal in all 13 states. Now, as you all know, leading up into the, the American Civil War, more and more states in the North are going to make slavery illegal. And it's going to kind of be part of the reason there is a Civil War in 1861. But even though there was not as many African slaves in the North, it's still legal in all 13 states. And slowly, year after year, more and more states will abolish it, where it will get to the point where the North, there are free states, and in the South, it is, uh, they are slave states. 
But the first, first state to actually make slavery illegal was Vermont. And it wasn't even a state at that time. It was independent. It was the Vermont Republic. So that was in 1777. Now in 1807, the Atlantic slave trade was abolished, but not slavery itself. So slavery was still legal in many states in the United States. But the actual trade across the ocean became illegal. And by this time, there are a lot of uh, blacks in, in, in the United States. In the North, there's more free blacks. Um, but in the South, uh, the, the black population was uh, enslaved. Um, and that was, that, was the, that was the status of slavery at that time. And in 1776, when, or even during the Constitution in the 1780s when they were making it, a lot of the founding fathers thought slavery would, be, um, would fade away. They thought it would just slowly go away, right? Because uh, some people considered putting it in the Constitution, but they were worried about making some powerful people in the South angry and, and dividing a very, very fragile country. And of course, it's going to divide the country, you know, less than 100 years later. But that was part of the idea at the time. And slavery would continue. And the demand would actually go up with the ad advent of the cotton gin in the late 1790s. And that would kind of take effect in, in the 1800s. Now, there's lots of, uh, you know, sla slaves would fight back, right? In colonial America, there was a Stono Rebellion. There was also a, a slave revolt in New York, New York City. And there's another one in 1800 called Gabriel's uh, Revolution, where he tried to gather people to steal guns and to fight back and take, take back, uh, um, develop an independent country or state. Uh, but that, that, that plot was foiled, and uh, the, the slaves who tried to uh, start this plan were, were punished and some were executed. But there is one successful slave rebellion, and that was the Haitian Revolution that took place between 1791 and 1804. Now, Haiti is an island in the Caribbean, which is also known as the West Indies, and those islands below Florida. And Haiti belonged to the French. It was a French colony. And, of course, by 1800, the French had lost a lot of land in the Western Hemisphere after the... French and Indian War, also known as the Seven Years' War. But they still owned some land, and, and by this time, by 1800, they also had Louisiana uh, in the mainland United States, west of the Mississippi. But Haiti was the most valuable property owned by the French because it had sugar. In fact, Louisiana, which was this huge territory west of the Mississippi, they didn't really value it much. It was used to bring resources like timber, lumber down the Mississippi River through New Orleans to Haiti because Haiti is what really made them a lot of money. But some uh, slaves, they started a rebellion in Haiti and they were successful. So this is the only time that there was a slave rebellion in the Western Hemisphere where they started a new country. And the French were forced out of Haiti. Some of them went, went back to France. Some of them went to the United States. And they even brought their slaves. Um, and in, in the United States, especially the South, they didn't want the slaves to know about this because they didn't want them to get an idea to do it too. Because by this time, the South is very fearful of a, of a, of a slave um, revolt. That the, they're very, you know, there's, there were a few before this, and then there was the Haitian Revolution. And in some states like South Carolina, there was a larger population of enslaved blacks than there were uh, white people. So this was a big fear for some of the, the people in the South. But this would inspire some free blacks in the north and also some enslaved blacks in, in, um, in the south or wherever they, wherever they were. This would be an inspiration. It was used as an example for many decades and it inspired people. It, it pushed the abolitionist movement forward. Um, but again, it terrified the people in the south. And they wanted to hide this information, but some of the slaves could read and it would spread, right? And some of the slaves that were brought from Haiti with their owners during the revolution, they would also tell stories about the about the Haitian Revolution. But this was one very successful revolution where the where the slaves fought back, and then they won. Now, Thomas Jefferson, he owned slaves, 
Uh, it's estimated that possibly on Monticello, which is his property, his plantation, he owned up to 400 slaves. And as I mentioned before, there was talks about uh, abolishing slavery when they were writing the Constitution. Now, Thomas Jefferson wrote the, the Declaration of Independence, which was signed on July 4th, 1776. And he considered blaming Britain for the, the institution of slavery in the New World and also considered writing something about freeing the, the slaves. But he was encouraged not to. Now, why would a man write that and still own slaves? You know, uh, that's the question. <laughs> um, and it's also worth mentioning that, you know, his wife died at a young age, and he did have children with Sammy Hemings, which was a slave on his plantation, uh, numerous children. And there were stories about this going, going around back then, but it was later, as of recently, that it was proven with DNA that he did have a child or some children with, with, um, with, with Sammy Hemings, one of his slaves. But Thomas Jefferson, he was a small government person. He was a Democratic Republican. Now remember, at this time, there's two political parties. George Washington didn't want any, so he wasn't a, a part of any political party, even though he kind of his actions and his policies were more federalist. But nature took its course, and people had different ideas, and the United States separated into, into two political parties, and it's the Federalists and the Democratic Republicans. Now, don't get confused between these two parties and the Democrats and Republicans of today. It's different. There are some similarities with the, the, the role of the central government and um, uh, and other issues, but it, don't get confused, right? These are different parties, right? They were different times, too. You know, Federalists were more strong federal government. They're more commercial, more businesslike, right? Um, while the South, um, oh, also with the Constitution, they, they thought the Constitution was good, but they thought, well, it could be loosely interpreted, right? They had the liberty to do what was necessary for the country. But the Democratic Republicans, which is also known as the Jeffersonian Republicans because of Jefferson, they were small government. They wanted the federal government not to be too powerful. They wanted the states to have the power. and They wanted to protect people's individual rights. They also believed in an agricultural economy because it was a lot of them were in the South, right? A lot of the Federalists were in the North, the Northeast, which was more commercial. But Jefferson also wanted to cut government budget, uh, wanted to reduce the national debt. So um, he also supported the French, right? Uh, he supported, uh, the, he wanted to help the French during the French Revolution, even though Washington didn't. Um, uh, but these are some of the ideas of, of Thomas Jefferson, and I think there is your ideals and there's reality when you become a president, right? So you have these ideas, but when reality takes place, you might not live up to those ideas. And you will find that Thomas Jefferson was actually a little bit more of a big government um, president. Okay, so I'm going to show you a short video from TED Education, uh, TED Ed. Uh, that will show you how Jefferson was actually more of a big government person other than a small government person. Have you heard the one about Thomas Jefferson and the Louisiana Territory? Thomas Jefferson, author of the Declaration of Independence, was not a fan of the new Constitution presented in 1787. He was very worried that the Constitution gave too much power to the new national government and not enough power to the states an issue known as big government. Jefferson only reluctantly agreed to support it when his friend James Madison promised to propose a Bill of Rights after it was ratified. But Jefferson's fears about big government did not go away. For example, Secretary of the Treasury Alexander Hamilton proposed a national bank in 1790, and Jefferson knew there was no provision in the Constitution to permit such a thing. Hamilton claimed some sort of implied powers mumbo-jumbo. Sure, it wasn't written in the Constitution, but the Constitution implied that it could be done. But Jefferson wasn't buying it. Nonetheless, the bank was established by Hamilton and President Washington. When Jefferson was sworn in as president in 1801, he pledged to reduce the size and scope of the national government. 
But of course, things didn't go exactly as he had planned. Spain secretly transferred the Louisiana Territory to France right beneath Jefferson's nose. When Congress found out, they quickly began discussions with France to buy a piece of the territory along the Mississippi River for about $2 million. But there was one little problem. Jefferson knew there was no provision in the Constitution to buy foreign territory. So what was a strict constructionist to do? First, he tried to get an amendment to the Constitution passed that would expressly permit the purchase, but Congress wasn't willing to do it. Then, without permission, the U.S. negotiators in France cut a deal for all of the territory for a cool $15 million. That new land doubled the size of the nation. Now Jefferson was really stuck. He knew that the territory would be a great acquisition for the country, providing lots of new land for farmers and other settlers, but how could he constitutionally justify it? In the end, Jefferson turned to the argument used by his old foe, Alexander Hamilton. He claimed that the power to purchase the territory is implied in the Constitution's treaty-making power. This was the exact argument that he had mocked openly a decade before, so it must have crushed his pride to have to use it. But more importantly, he may have committed the biggest big government play ever. How ironic is it? that one of the biggest opponents of big government doubled the size of the young country and did so while openly questioning its constitutionality. At $15 million, which is about three cents an acre, it has been called by many the greatest real estate deal in the history of the United States. Okay, I hope you enjoyed that, that video from Ted N. Now, uh, just to go over a little bit more about the Louisiana Purchase, Obviously, this is going to double the size of the United States. And the United States is going to continue moving more and more west until it meets, reaches the Pacific Ocean. But this is a huge pur purchase and is a big government move. And remember, Jefferson, as a Democratic Republican, was supposedly a small government. You know, follow the Constitution line by line. But he went against what his ideals were. But nonetheless, this territory you see on the, on the map here, which is white, used to belong to France, right? Spain gave it to France in 1800. And it was 827,000 uh, square miles. And the value here, like I was mentioning earlier, is bringing resources down to the Mississippi River through New Orleans to Haiti. Haiti was the valuable territory of the French. And, but the French lost Haiti during the Haitian Revolution. And this valuable possession was gone. So this Louisiana Purchase, which was just flat land until you got to some mountains, the, the Rocky Mountains, wasn't really considered that valuable. And Napoleon, this is after the French Revolution, Napoleon, who was fighting the Napoleonic Wars in Europe, of course wanted a Western Empire. But after losing Haiti and being in the Napoleonic Wars in Europe, uh, where there was, he was fighting everybody in Europe, he gave up on his dream and he decided you know they need the money for the wars and they will forget this dream of having a western empire so they're going to they're going to sell it to to Jefferson and sell it to the Americans and Jefferson just wanted a little part of New Orleans so they could export products down the river and then they said well we'll, we'll say, sell you the whole thing and then he couldn't give up that uh, opportunity so uh, so they sold it to Tom, Thomas Jefferson and Napoleon offered to sell it all for $15 million. That's $250 million today. So this is an unbelievable deal that, 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 um, that Jefferson made with Napoleon. Now, that territory is unknown. Um, there are mostly Native Americans in that territory. There's still some French, because French used to live there, some Spanish. Uh, but, and they, but they weren't close together like in big cities like Boston or New York. They were spread out. But mostly Native Americans and some Native Americans who have never even seen a white person before, right? And this is, this is 1800. This is 300 years after the Spanish had first come to the New World. But nonetheless, uh, the Americans and Jefferson did, didn't know what was there. They didn't know the geography. They didn't know what kind of animals and plants and people were there. 
and what rivers to, to, to travel on, and what ways they can move to the West. So he sent some of his friends who were U.S. Army generals, uh, Wary Mether Lewis and William Clark, and they started an expedition of men that would uh, sail up the Missouri close to the Rocky Mountains where they get off and get on some horses and they go all the way to the Pacific and along the way they would take notes and re records of what kind of plants and what kind of animals and what type of people they would meet. Uh, and an, an important person in this story of Lewis and Clark is Sacagoya, which was a Native American that would help them. She was married to a Frenchman so she could speak some French so she could speak to one of the guys in the expedition who spoke French who could translate into English and that's how that helped them get all the way across. Uh, to the Pacific Ocean. But this is the Lewis and Clark expedition exploring the new Louisiana purchase that Jefferson had just made. Now, another big government move by Jefferson is called the Embargo Act. Now, if you remember, please see my, my last video. Uh, during the 1800s and the late 1700s, well, there was a French Revolution and the British were fighting in that too, and the British needed some soldiers, or they needed some Navy men. So they would often go on American ships, and they were usually looking for British Navy uh, men who were running away from the British Navy. They didn't want to fight. So they wanted to bring them back and force them to fight against the French. But they also stole the Americans and had them, forced them into the, the, the British Navy as well. This was called impressment. And the Americans wanted to stop that, so they signed Jay's Treaty with Britain. Uh, they wanted to be paid back for the, the damages done to the merchant ships and also some other um, uh, anger, things that made them angry, like having uh, British troops still in mainland United States and arming the Native Americans. That was the Jay's Treaty. But when they signed the Jay's Treaty, France was mad because the Americans weren't helping the French during the French Revolution. And they're thinking, why we helped you during the American Revolution, why don't you help us? So the French are angry, so they're attacking American ships. So this is in the 1790s, but in the 1800s, it's going to still continue. Uh, and in the early 1800s, you know, you're going to have British, they're going to still, there's the Napoleonic Wars, right? The French Revolution's over, but the Napoleonic Wars, so British are going to force American soldiers into the, or, or just common people on merchant ships into the British Navy. The French would attack them, the Spanish would atta attack them. There were even attacks in the Mediterranean from the Barbary states in the northern Africa. So this was the times, right? You know, pirates and stuff like that out in the ocean. Um, and Jefferson, well, actually there was an event in 1807 it was called the British, it's when the British attacked the USS Chesapeake. Uh, and this was right near Virginia and near the Chesapeake Bay. And uh, this was a pretty, well, you know, American ship. And the Americans were not that powerful. The Navy wasn't that powerful at that time. But this angered the Americans. So many of them wanted to go to war. But at that time, since Washington, the United States was a country, uh, a neutral country. It was, you know, the Proclamation of Neutrality by George Washington, where they thought it was best to stay out of foreign affairs, uh, avoid a, a war or being involved in wars in Europe that had nothing to do with the United States. And Jefferson didn't want to go to war either. So what did he do? He passed the Embargo Act. And this closed all American ports to foreign trade. Now, obviously there's a reason for doing this, but this is going to devastate the economy. Uh, and it's going to make the Federalists angry. Remember, the Federalists are more commercial, more businesslike. So they're going to be prevented from trading. Um, and it's going to hurt the economy, so it's going to hurt American people. It's actually going to help the British because though the British is going to hurt the trade with the United States, all the countries like in the Caribbean or even in Europe, are, they're going to have access to all those markets while the Americans aren't going to compete with them because they close the ports. Um, and what do the Americans do? They revert to smuggling, kind of like during the American Revolution because all the restrictions from the British forced the, the colonists to, to smuggle. And the same thing is going to happen now. They're going to do a lot of smuggling. And Jefferson's going to expand the power of government to stop this, to punish the smugglers. So the, 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 it's kind of ironic, you know, the founding father who was against taxation without representation or all the, the rules and regulations and control by the British. Now he's going to do it as, as a president in, in, in a sense. Um, and also, it's, it's kind of an example of big government. Louisiana Purchase, that was big government. It wasn't constitutional, but he did it anyways. And now he's going to not give people the freedom to trade. 
he had a reason to do it, but you know, uh, it's it's more of like a big government move. And if you look at this cartoon, which is an interesting cartoon, you see Jefferson with a turtle, and he's he's grabbing the guy, he's grabbing the smuggler, and it says license. So it's kind of showing the uh, the the. the the regulations, right, for the smugglers, the punishments. And it says, damn it, how he nicks them. And then the guy says, the smuggler says, oh, this cursed old grab me. Oh, grab, what's an old grab me? Well, old grab me is embargo spelled backwards. So this is not going to make, uh, this is not going to make Thomas Jefferson very powerful or popular. <laughs> um, so that's really it. You know, you have this president, this enlightened, intelligent, polyglot, polymath, very brilliant man uh, who wrote the Declaration of Independence, who was a founding father, uh, who was a Secretary of State, who could speak French. He was over in France for a while and traveled through Europe, speak uh, Latin, uh, could even speak some dialects of Native American languages. Uh, just a brilliant man uh, who uh, believed in kind of a small federal government, but when he became president, it wasn't that small. <laughs> it was actually big. So some people can say he was, a, he was a big government person. But after eight years, he would stop being president. And he could have ran for another four years. By the Constitution, he could run every four years, as long as he was elected by the people uh, in the, the elector, elector, uh, electors and electoral college. He could continue to be president. But just like George Washington, who stopped after eight years, it started a tradition. And every president would only be president for four or eight years. After eight years, they wouldn't run again. And this is, of course, up until FDR. And FDR would do three terms, and he would start a fourth term before passing away. And after that, there would be an amendment that says the president can only run for two terms, eight years. But Jefferson could have ran, but he didn't. He, he stepped down. Um, this picture is Monticello. And this is his plantation. This is a, a building he designed uh, with his father in his 20s. Uh, after he got up, stopped being president, he opened up the University of Virginia, which is one of his, his something that made him very proud. Right on his gravestone, it says, "Here was buried Thomas Jefferson, author of the Declaration of American Independence, of the Statute of Virginia for Religious Freedom, and father of the University of Virginia." So those were his most proud moments: the the university, the separation of church and state. And the Declaration of Independence, um, and that's it. You know, and another interesting story is he would die exactly 50 years after the signing of the Declaration of Independence, July 4th, 1826, and his friend John Adams died on the exact same day. So how ironic or how interesting that the two of the founding fathers, who were friends in in allies during the founding of the nation and then they became bitter enemies because one was a federalist and one was a democratic republican during their times in office and then they became friends again as they got older and they were retiring john adams was up in massachusetts in boston um jefferson was in virginia and they were writing each other letters and they became friends again and they both made it they must have just been surviving they knew they were going to die and they just made it to that 50th anniversary and John Adams was up in Boston, and one of his last words supposedly was, uh, Je Jefferson survives. But little did he know, Jefferson had died hours before. Neither, neither one knew of it. So very, very uh, happy ending in a way, right? So um, That's it. I hope you enjoyed this. If you made it this far, I really appreciate it. Uh, please give me some suggestions on what you'd like to watch. Uh, please give me a like, share my video, subscribe. Uh, I'm going to be doing all American history every week with a couple weeks off here and there. But by, uh, by next summer, 2021, I'll have all these videos done. So I hope this helps you. I hope it helps with your class. Or if you're a teacher, uh, if you're a teacher, please check out my IOLA great lessons on Teachers Pays Teachers, uh, the store. Thank you.